On this episode of Doing the Most, we are going to be talking to Storm, everybody's favorite Reddit information troll on the Mead Sub. <laughs> Moment brews and various artists, everything from Mead to Rose. Big creation, fermentation, and ebriation, doing the most. I had had given the the proposition that we would do like a mead mythbusters episode and then it in doing my research i got on reddit's mead sub and i searched for help and i i found a bunch of i think i sorted by popularity from the last year and i found some good stuff and then i searched for some more prevalent topics and i put together a top 10 list for you of the the top 10 things it seems like reddit's mead sub needs to learn or know based on actual real posts from r slash mead. And so we've got that list here tonight. And first thing I want to ask you is what are you drinking? I've got a elderflower braggot here, little ways into it, uh, but it's uh, with heather and hops and elderflower and then a gold malt extract because I'm a lazy beer maker <laughs> and then just a wildflower honey. Um, I let this one ferment dry. I had uh, two batches, one I back sweet and the other I, I left. I think I liked it a little sweeter, but this drinks a little bit more like a pills with a little bit of hop uh, in it in the end. Uh, not quite IPA level of hops, but pretty tasty. Okay. What hop are you using in that? Uh, Cascade in this okay. one. Keeping it simple. Probably going to make this one again. Uh, my neighbor has uh, Cascade hops that I'm going to harvest and uh, see if nice. I can't make a natural one that and some uh, elderflower I harvested myself and it'll be, it'll be fun. Something That's you cool. made with your own hands. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit more um, rewarding. I feel like mm -hmm. well, that, that natural approach we were talking about earlier. I've got the <laughs> <laughs> Wampus cat braggot here recipes on the channel. That's made with uh, in a five gallon batch, a pound and a half of buckwheat honey, four and a half, I think pounds of wildflower honey centennial hops in this one and then there's a, a hour-long mash with just a pound of honey malt and so the honey malt provides just a little bit of that like residual sweetness and malty edge to kind of tie everything together so i've organized these storm by category i felt like that was probably the the easiest way to trudge through all of this and are you prepared are you ready I'm ready. I've got them uh, on my other monitor, ready to read them <laughs> off as you do. <laughs> got it. So we're going to start on the topic of oxidation. And I will tell you from my Instagram traffic and from a lot of my YouTube comments, people have a lot of concerns about oxidation in their mead. And so I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. This post was titled, just started my first batch of mead, comma, help. <laughs> So <laughs> oxidation is a huge issue in mead and in brewing in general. It's very easy to be careless, to open it too much, and to get too much air in there. Um, and it creates uh, either just muting your flavors, which isn't wanted, you know, less aromatics, less flavor, or in the worst case, a very nasty cardboardy taste. Um, mm. You can get a little bit of oxidation and it just mutes the flavors, but as soon as you start getting a lot, it's just not drinkable. Fortunately, mead is the most resilient of beverages uh, against it by a lot. Uh, part of it's our ABV, and then part of it is just mead. Uh, honey is less oxidizable than hops. So no, if you opened it in primary, you're fine. Um, I have a very nice CO2 system where I can uh, backfill every time I open stuff and it's very easy for me to manage it. But if you've got an active fermentation going on in there, it's filled with CO2. Uh, you take a hydrometer reading and it's gone from uh, 1.050 to 1.040, you're fine. And you can probably open it once, maybe twice with no CO2 uh, layer in there and you're never going to have a problem so long as it's stays an airlock on there you leave it open for a day still probably fine you know if you leave it open for a little while you're going to want to put a blanket on top of it you know a co2 blanket fill the whole headspace with co2 because even though it's heavy it doesn't it diffuses after a little mm -hmm. bit but no uh opening it once post fermentation is it's not going to kill anything. That's that's the really kind of adorable thing about this post was they like they opened it long enough to clean out their airlock. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're concerned <laughs> about 
oxidation. Um, a so a little hole, <laughs> right? And so just to kind of follow up on that one, if if they felt like there was a need to introduce CO two to the must to blanket it, what are some like homebrewer consumer level ways that they could do that? Two ways. Uh, one, you go throw 10 bucks at either your local brew store or Amazon or whatever and get wine preserver and spray it in. It's going to be argon, nitrogen, CO2, uh, whatever the flavor. Uh, or if you've got a kegerager, which I'd recommend if you're getting you know really serious about this stuff and want to drop some money on things, having CO2 on tap, you put the hose in there, you turn on the keg, very, very easy solution. There are a lot of questions on r slash mead about yeast. Uh, and I, I tried to to organize these by uh, like beginner to intermediate level <laughs> questions. This one says, help, forgot to rehydrate yeast. They're concerned whether they should add more yeast that's properly been <laughs> rehydrated. It's been, Storm, it's been 10 hours and he still didn't see any bubbling. <laughs> Uh, so starting with the easiest parts, uh, 24 to 48 uh, hours for bubbling if it happens. Some uh, yeasts are very low foaming. If you get looking real close and you see real tiny bubbles coming up and no head space, uh, sorry, no uh, crossing like you see in beer, it's fermenting. It's just a low foaming yeast. It's common with wine. It's okay. After about 72 hours without that, that's when I'd be saying, okay, really time to repitch here. But the only thing that's going to happen is if you pitch that too hot, like into your um, rehydrating liquid, you know, you're supposed to have uh, 20 times the weight of the yeast as water, and it's supposed to be at 105 degrees. 105 is great. 120, if your thermometer sucks, that's uh, too hot. And 140 while your yeast is dead. Um, with enough time. Probably not going to repitch. Rehydrating uh, Rehydrating is important. It gets optimal yeast counts. If you wanted to not rehydrate and pitch th- three times as much yeast as you would normally, I mean, it, it works. I'm not saying it's the right way to do it, but rehydration and rehydration with GoFirm is specifically for getting optimal cell counts and repeatable cell counts with the right amount of uh, nitrogen in the the must, as well as fatty acids that help the yeast have reliable ABV tolerance. Okay, so then this person was asking about all natural yeast nutrient. They had watched a video on YouTube that made them feel like maybe a more natural approach to nutrient uh, was, was the right way to go. There are certain uh, YouTubers out there that have a different uh, approach to mead making uh-huh. than I do. Um, and uh, one of the funny things is there's some grain of truth in there. You can, in fact, make a mead that needs no additional nutrients. It's going to be bananas, strawberries, and mangoes. And it's going to be 12 pounds total with no, no water, just honey on top. Yeah. Uh, to about uh, 10% ABV, 15% ABV. That's enough yan. Uh, yeast assimilable nitrogen. Uh, if you're not fermenting that particular thing, you need more nitrogen. Uh, grape wine requires uh, 200 yam, give or take. Uh, by default, it has somewhere between 100 and 150, and that is with pure grape juice. Mm-hmm. 50 raisins does not compare to pure <laughs> grape juice, period. Yeah, A uh, little bit of raisins can make things ferment better, put a little bit of tannins in it. But at the end of the day, it just needs more if you want ABV reliability, um, if you want to avoid stalls, and if you want to have a timely ferment. You know, a two-week ferment, it takes firm Ed K and go firm. It's, it's clear from internet traffic that there has been a real move toward embracing what people to believe to be natural or historically accurate fermentation processes. So if somebody really had a a devotion, a dedication to all natural brewing, particularly with a lens of of giving their yeast the nutrient that it needs to do an effective fermentation, what would your recommendation be if maybe they don't maybe they live in a country where they don't have access to fermento yeah. or K? Keep keep it to five percent ABV, uh, two pounds of fruit per gallon throw a little bit of oat or some grain in there. Uh, if you've got access to malt, great. Make brackets. It'll ferment reliably every time at 5%. How do you feel about uh, the advice 
to like boil baker's yeast and add that to your must? Well, actually, I'm I'm one of the guys who popularized that. Um, I don't want to say to my regret because I do think it's a very good low tech way to do this. Uh, I, I made the wiki recipes, and I wanted something that would be available to anyone. If you're in Europe, you're going to have a hard time finding Fermate O. If you're in Australia, you're going to have a hard time finding Fermate K. Their equivalent is Fermate A, I believe. Mm -hmm. Uh, For import reasons, it has to be different for some reason or another. You know, so I I put some substitutes on there. If you boil baker's yeast, you will get reliable fermentation. I've done it myself. Uh, I have fermented to 18%. Uh, It fermented very similar to my Fermate O. People could not tell the difference in triangle testing. Mm maybe it took a skosh longer, but not enough for me to say that it was just statistically relevant. I've run out of Fermate O, boiled bread yeast, and used it, you know, bef- before I had stockpiles of this stuff. And it does work a heck of a lot better than just throwing honey in a pot and crossing your fingers. So that kind of leads into this next post of someone was asking, is, is Tazna 2.0 the de facto end-all be-all, uh, uh, like the perfect mead nutrient schedule or is there a more preferred way or uh, probably kind of asking is there a more cost effective way how do you feel about tosna 2.0 uh cost effective yes that's an easy one uh using a blount elliott uh staggered nutrient addition is more cost effective uh diammonium phosphate is the cheapest nitrogen source out there with the biggest percentage of nitrogen can be contributed to it there's no way to get around that uh, now, is it the best? That's a different question. Um, if you're making a 14% traditional or maybe with 15% uh, residual sugar potential, yeah, Tosna is really good. You're going to get something that has just a touch of residual sugar to it. It fermented just a little bit slower than if you're using uh, a lot of Fermade K, uh, you know, mixed with Fermade O and DAP and the appropriate amounts to not get too fast of a ferment. And it leaves just that small amount of residual sugar reliably. And that makes for a good young mead. You take that same thing around for a super fruit mead, something that's you know 12 pounds of fruit per gallon, and it's the wrong choice. And you'll figure that out pretty quick if you uh, try doing a, a lot of uh, mead that way. You're going to do DAP and Fermed K pretty much exclusively, and you'll get a more reliable ferment. Part of the reason for that is superfruits need high final gravities. I have a couple of meads right now that are going to end at uh, 1.03 to 1.05, and they're going to need back sweetening because the mm. fruit is so tart. Some of the hibiscus, some of the raspberry, some of the tart cherry to it needs a lot of residual sugar to support it. And also, since you have that much residual sugar on the front side, because these are put all the honey in and then let it ferment, uh, rather than back sweeten, they are all naturally stabilized. Uh, you need some heavy lifters to get that going, uh, and Fermade K is the answer to that. Uh, it's got great micronutrients. It's got a little bit of DAP. It's got a little bit of Fermade O, and that is very, very important to get a happy colony moving quick. And so, is that in your in your experience, is that crucial for for a smooth ferment start to finish? Or is it crucial for drinkability sooner rather than later or both? What is, how does that, Uh, for the beginner brewer who has no idea what we're talking about right now, what does that change in nutrient schedule look like? It's important to get that ferment to go quickly. Quickly is uh, synonymous with reliable. Uh, If it goes slow, it could stall at any ABV. Who, who knows what? And so then you've got way too much residual sugar, just a terrible cloying mead if you've got too much residual. Um, uh, the other big thing is, you know, flavor. If you've gone and starved it of nitrogen, uh, you can produce sulfurs, uh, bad theols, uh, all this stuff that you just don't want to taste. Most of them will age out. Sulfur is going to be gone in six months, even if you do your worst job possible of it. You know, worst case scenario, you give it a stir with a copper wand and poof, like magic, the sulfur is gone. Okay, so this one I feel like is probably uh, close to your heart because I know this is a yeast that you brew a lot with. Yeah. This person was asking about EC1118, a Lalvin yeast. They said they just got a bunch of packets. They understand that its tolerance is 18%. You may, um, you may have a different opinion on that. Do you have any advice on how to use this yeast? 
so uh, to preface this, not quite the question, but every yeast has a purpose. Uh, it has something that it does well. There are yeasts that I don't like, but every single one of them has something that makes it the right yeast for a specific situation. Lavin one one eighteen is one of my favorites. I cannot recommend it enough to people, but it's for specific things. It's for when you have high pH, you want a high ABV, and you want to start with a high OG. Um, I ferment these t- traditional Dwozniaks. Uh, it's a Polish mead that has one part honey to one part water. If you go do that with you know, some ale yeast, it's not going to be drinkable. I get about 20 to 21%. I topped out at 22 uh, once with a batch. And you can't do that with any other yeast. I make these port-like wines that are very, very incredible. You age them for six months to two years and they're very, very, very good to drink. If you're not looking to make an 18% mead with residual sugars, it's the wrong tool. You want to use uh, QA23, one of my favorites. Uh, mm-hmm. It's 16%, uh, if my memory serves, uh, potential ABV yeah. on it. And it's got this tropical pineapple ester to it that goes well with every single honey I have ever had. And it's it's ready in three months. I have a trad that I, or a traditional that I can drink right now that was six months old and I could drink it at 45 days at 16%. And it was good. That's I mean, awesome. I would, I would have entered it in a competition at two months. Is the same level of urgency as is required for beer required for mead to get it off of the yeast. So remind me, Unpack uh, that. <laughs> you copied this directly. This is not your opinions that we're unpacking here, right? This is no, not no, no, that no, you think. No. Be- All right. So a tall assistant <laughs> beer is bull in the first place <laughs> it's like, just it's home just brewers aren't even doing secondary no. in large part anymore there are, there are two things that are required for autolysis uh pressure and temperature pressure being the first one um you go get a 10 barrel brewing system uh, a fast ferment that you've got pressure and you've got temperature you get autolysis if you let it sit about for a while uh your one gallon batch is never going to i don't care what yeast you're using it's just not um, if you use a wine yeast in a five-gallon batch, still not. 15-gallon batch, my champagne yeasts, it, it, you know, it's X number of feet tall. I think it's uh, two feet and a couple of inches tall for my 15-gallon fermenters. Uh, six months, no, you don't get autolysis. But if you start getting into bigger stuff, you know, if you've got a barrel fermenter, yeah, you want to get that off in a month, maybe two weeks. If you're doing like a champagne style and you're like riddling the fine lees, uh, getting this stuff re-immersed into the bottle time and time again, yes, you get a little bit of a nutty flavor from controlled autolysis. It takes a ton of effort, a ton of time. Uh, and it's, you know, <laughs> shaking the bottles to get that stuff back into uh, suspension, not yeah. in a one gallon. I've been I've been trying to push more toward the like from primary to bottling bucket kind of recipes because I feel like that's that really helps the beginner brewer kind of like Mm -hmm. hone in on process and so yeah there are some of these recipes that I'm testing out right now where I'm like mixing all the into primary just like stirring it up so the yeast is just getting kicked back up in there and I just I know that people are gonna be like what the hell are you doing but I I don't I don't feel like for some of these short, like these session meads, these hydromels, where really, if you can get it clear in primary <laughs> and go to your bucket, stirring up that yeast, I'm not super concerned about it. 30 days with a couple of clarifiers. Like if you put betonite in primary, you're going to have a 30 day clear bead. Um, although there is one thing I wanted to segue back to um, okay. with autolysis. Uh, a lot of people think they have autolysis. They might have a infection. They might have oxidation. Um, unless you've had a real panel with real faults, it's very hard to identify these, especially over a medium as uh, poor at communicating uh, taste and smell as the internet. Yeah. I mean, how, how do you truly tell something or tell someone how something smells over the right. internet? It's like trying to describe the color blue to a blind man. Especially if so, you're very new at this and, and you're mm-hmm. learning what, what adjectives match what you're sensing. Vinegary for dry mead is the other big one. Yeah, uh, or it's sour. Not, yes, sour. People describe it as vinegar when it's sour because it's tart, because it's acidic, and there's no residual right. sugar, and there's no tannins. You fix those two, and it doesn't taste right. sour anymore. 
we had a poster that that said that they had a sparkling mango session hydromel slash melomel and they were curious on the community's thoughts of fruit in secondary versus fruit in primary and i i have it depends for me on on the product that you're making where in in the flavor profile that you're going for where you want to land on on primary versus secondary versus sometimes both but i'm curious your thoughts on this really happy you said both because i'm a firm believer in both um i favor primary i like the taste of fermented fruit um for my hydromels i'm a secondary kind of guy because i want it to taste like you know blueberries and I don't want to use 50 pounds of blueberries for something that I'm going to be drinking in three weeks because my D and D guy is going pounding through it. Right. Um, you go put that in primary and you get a lot more use out of it. I think it's about 30% more flavor out of it in secondary uh, versus primary. So the other thing is smell. Uh, smell is much better preserved in secondary. So if you've got like, let's say tart cherries in primary, and then like this guy is talking about mangoes in secondary. Well, you could make something that's tart with this cherry earthy undertone, you know, fermented earthy tart cherries yeah. and then a mango smell to it. And maybe like a little bit of hibiscus in it to kind of pop some of those fruit flavors. You can make something that tastes like one thing and smells like another, which is really, really cool and shows a lot of uh, talent with your brewing abilities. Um, yeah. Or you do, Blueberries in primary, blueberries in secondary, blueberry and tertiary, and you get this huge spec spectrum of blueberry flavors with lots of different nuance to it. Or you just do everything in primary like a <laughs> fermented fruit ought to be. <laughs> yeah. This post said, question, exclamation point, anything and everything helps. It says, when doing a basic dry batch, is it important for me to transfer to another bottle? So this is a person asking, is is secondary necessary basically post ferment yeah mm -hmm. um so there's there's two answers to this one is a competition are you looking that mead needs to be perfectly clear with no sediment in the bottom of the bottles yes secondary is necessary if you're willing to decant your mead and not you know give the bottle to someone else to pour nobody's really going to care if there's that much sediment in the bottles you know you lose a little bit to cloudiness if you do that but you drink the last glass yourself and it's fine i like to have my stuff as clear as possible because i like to give it out and say hey how do you feel about this this is what you're looking for in a good mead um tell me how i did and clarity is important for that you'll taste with your eyes first you know you go look at it in a glass and say mm, what does this look like and a clear mead looks better especially in you know fancy cut crystal but it's for presentation uh and a little bit of difference in the mouth feel with suspended yeast and particles mm -hmm. yeah that's certainly present but it's going to be in the last uh glass out of the bottle so the uh, long story is it depends but you know and it depends <laughs> on how long you've been brewing yeah yeah i i i'm moving more toward trying to avoid secondary Mm -hmm. But that is because I am doing so many session style meads and because I'm kegging. And so I know yeah. that I can find a lot of these that have just like a little bit of haze with some gelatin and then just mm -hmm. pour off that first pint after it's been in the keg for yeah. a month. <laughs> You're doing a secondary. It just happens to be a cold right. crash on top of it. <laughs> right, right. Drink the first one. The rest are good. I do a lot of my hydromels the same way. <laughs> stabilizing without chemicals really the heart of this post was was an anti-chemical kind of of quarry mm -hmm. but they also asked about pasteurizing to kill off any yeast without affecting the flavor and also they're curious if pasteurizing was going to somehow boil off alcohol and affect the alcohol content so i remember this about? post i think i, I answered think this post this <laughs> a lot actually <laughs> Um, so, uh, to preface everything, I sterile filter, um, that allows me to back sweeten. Um, my stepfather is immunocompromised. Uh, he can't have live drinks. Um, I've looked at them under a microscope. They're dead. There's nothing going on in there. How many microns are you going to? Uh, that? I use a half micron absolute filter, uh, after doing a three stage, um, canister filter. You know, that's for my 
stuff that I'm sharing that way. For the stuff that I'm saying is my show quality stuff, I use ABV to stabilize. I do not use any chemicals uh, for stabilization uh, anywhere in my process. I don't pasteurize. The only reason I would pasteurize is if I wanted to carbonate. And so then uh, carbonate naturally, I'd put sugars in there, you know, honey, table sugar, whatever. Pasteurize it when I hit the pressure I wanted and then have a sweet mead when it's all said and done. Um, I think we spend so much time and effort getting raw honey with the best aromatics that we can find that I I suppose pasteurization probably isn't the end of the world for aromatics, (laughs) but it just seems weird. And it's a hassle. You know, it takes two hours to do something like that. My sterile filters I'm done in 15 minutes and five of those was drinking my first glass of mead while I decided (laughs) uh, how to do something. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Scrubbing. Yeah, I, I'm not like anti-pasteurization, but particularly mm-hmm. my concern is with with folks that are trying to pasteurize something that's been bottle conditioned, mm-hmm. um, because there seems to be a lot of chatter about that online, and just the fact that air expands and they're putting something that's been capped mm-hmm. and, and it it feels real freaky to me to be doing I have that. a mechanical and engineering background and I uh, understand how <laughs> the gas pressures work. You will never pop one of those by raising it okay. uh, to 150. If you boil it, that's a whole different damn scenario. Raise the pressure by a, a little bit. It's not going to be a big deal, but if you go start changing the state, the liquid is into gas, whole different game. Okay. And that'll happen around 150, 160 uh, degrees uh, Fahrenheit, depending on your concentration of liquid, uh, you know, whether how much is ethanol, how much of it is water. So the relationship is pretty linear fashion between the two. So see, now you have me scared again. So, <laughs> well, pasteurizing a sous pot at 145 for the appropriate length of time. There you go. <laughs> It'll be fine. It's stupid proof. Okay. So, final question of our top 10. This one that just cracks me up. Because it's just like so subjective. <laughs> I mean, it's it's based on so many factors, but I I am curious how you're gonna handle it. Does anyone know about gauging the optimal aging time? Oh, pick me. <laughs> yeah, pick me. Yeah, right there in the front. Uh so optimal we're looking for a rule of thumb here. Um every two percent ABV uh is a month. You know, or sorry, yeah, two percent ABV is a month here. So if you've got like a eighteen percent ABV mead, it's going to be better in a year than it is in a month. If you've got a five percent ABV, you can drink that in three three months. That's no big deal. You probably can drink it a little bit younger than that rule of thumb if you've got good nutrition. If you've got really bad nutrition, it's going to be longer than that. You know, if you're doing you know magic rate magic raisins and you know a magic brew stick to get your yeast yeah. it could be longer it could be shorter i've got one of those back here yep uh wooden paddle <laughs> nothing yeah. wrong with a good wooden paddle or boches but yeah good rule of thumb um some people say as long as uh, a month per percent abv i think that's a little excessive i think modern nutrition's gone and improved some time on that go firm is magic you go get 250 yen and it shouldn't take that long to age. And if it is taking that long to age, go take a look at your acid, tannin, sugar balance. Mm-hmm. And you might find that a little bit of help in that department helps things taste good a hell of a lot younger. That's an interesting point. We actually on the Instagram today, there was a comment from someone because I had published a, a crispy hydromel recipe a few months ago. And it's based on Meridian Hive's um, honey flavored hydromel. I don't know if you've had that one. Oh, I have. And I have many good things to say about Meridian it's, Hive. It, that one is so good. And so I, I had tried to kind of clone that recipe and it's got mm-hmm. an acid tannin adjustment that happens in there to kind of give it that, that pop. And, and there was an Instagram comment today on one of our older posts where somebody said, after watching this video, I started doing acid and tannin adjustments to my meads and they have become so much better. I'm like, yes, yes, thank you. Like this is this is real stuff that we're doing. Like this yeah. is this is science. This is this is physics and chemistry and and 
it's not scary. Like the powdered stuff is not scary. I have a copy paste on the wiki <laughs> for that. I every day, um, yeah. slapping it down, saying, "Here, go to this, do this tannin balance thing, and just it'll make better mead." Yeah, it's it's wild, and I th- I, I think I had replied to one of your comments a couple months ago, mm-hmm. but we were doing a collab with Homebrew Ohio where they sent me some fruit purees to mm-hmm. attempt to do hydromels with. And there was a boysenberry and a blackberry. And both Oof. of them, I had just done, the blackberry was like 4.4 pounds of puree and the boysenberry mm-hmm. was 3.3 pounds, I think, of puree. What, and I did, one gallon? I, no, I, I did them as hydromels and I did those in five gallon batches. So okay. I, I put them in in secondary. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. with a little bit of acid and tannin adjustment, um, each needed a little bit of like citric or malic and a little bit of tannin, but just that little, it's like turning the radio dial. Yeah. It's amazing how much those fruit flavors suddenly just burst to life. Yes, (laughs) for real. And, and I just wish folks, I wish folks would experiment with that more rather than, you know, a lot of folks get really discouraged by, by the balance issues. And they, it's like you said with autolysis, they're, they're looking for other things to blame when really it's just about turning that dial a little bit. Yep. I, I have never had a mead in, well, the last couple of years, at least. We won't talk about some of the early ones where Fair. I can <laughs> dial in the, uh, the sweetness and the acidity and say, this is worth drinking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I figured we would end on a bonus, if that's okay. Advanced equipment. Yeah. So this person was about to have their birthday. And it looks like their significant other had approved an up to $400 home brewing purchase. Again, for context, this person had everything that they needed to make, to, to make good mead. But they were looking at a kegerator, stainless fermenter, wort chiller. So if you, I know you have, like I do, lots of fun toys to play with. But if you were a, a home brewer that just had the basics, some carboys, and all the chemicals and nutrients and scales and things, but you want to just go down to the local homebrew store and blow four hundred bucks. I wouldn't go to the homebrew store. I'd go to Craigslist. If you were buy someone's to old, <laughs> someone's old kegerator that they said, "I'm done with this hobby. I don't yeah. need to do this anymore." I'd buy a kegerator and I'd buy a couple empty kegs and or a CO two canister to go with it. I just pulled up Craigslist right now. I have one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, I got pages of four hundred dollar yeah. kegerators. They're one tap, two tap, whatever. But oh my god, that is the first thing I would do if I was looking yeah. to go drop four hundred bucks and up my game. So I wanted to do a keyser build for the channel. This was mm-hmm. like I had this grand vision that I was going to do this multi part series. Then the pandemic happened and everybody bought all the freezers. <laughs> so like, I can't get all, I've been to Home Depot and Best Buy and Lowe's and I can't find the ones I want. And so I'm with you, man, if I oh had 400 God. bucks in just like cash, I wanted to blow. And you aren't in, kidding. In enough time to just like troll Craigslist all week and find somebody who hadn't sold it 30 minutes before. Yeah. I bought my kegerator for my 10 tap uh, for like $120. I think the cheapest one on here that I see that's even close to the size is $600 right now. Yeah, that's there's insane. A, there's a run, <laughs> man. I really appreciate the level of depth that you went through on this because like this is this is the kind of content that I want to be putting out. And so I'm I'm really happy to be just like bathing people in just all of the... Th- I mean, because that, that's it's real. You've been studying this studying this for for a while now and so yeah, it's about, nice to be able to 10 share years now. that depth of information in a way that i think hits a pretty good spectrum of beginner to intermediate concerns on the mead making process so you had mentioned earlier and i want you to to talk about this a little bit on r slash mead there is a monthly mead challenge Mm-hmm. And so talk to me a little bit about what that looks like and what the expectations are and how all that works. Well, it's developed a little bit since the start. Um, used to be, I was throwing it out a little bit more to get other people to host it, um, which I'd still love to uh, have other people put some effort into it, but it's kind of on me now, but I do crowdsource it a lot. So I go and say, Hey, 
this month, what's good? You know, we're getting into fall here. We've got Sizer, we've got Pymans, we've got a couple of others that you're throwing, uh, you know, something out to see what sticks. Um, and it's looking like it's probably going to be a Sizer this month. Um, so I'll go toss out a recipe for what I'm going to make, you know, and then everyone else brews the recipe. That's similar to that. And not the exact same thing, but similar. And then you come back and say, all right, I like this. Or someone else says, Dad, this didn't work for me. You know, some of the users, uh, Tank Autumn on the subreddit has been really incredible doing almost every single one of them and providing awesome. really incredible feedback for everyone. And they help people do different styles of mead. Yeah. Um, some of Take them, I, your comfort zone. yeah, I never would have done some of them. Uh, but others, you know, uh, a very, very high ABV traditional with 11118, a lot of people wouldn't have necessarily put that in their brew book. Sure. Um, you know, we did uh, meads with molasses. We did meads with uh, strange spices, you know, uh, meads of flowers, meads yeah, with hops. I think there was a mango one, mango yeah. pea blossom or something Mango like butterfly pea blossom. <laughs> Mine sucked. But it's fun. Like, it, it takes you outside your yeah. comfort zone and it exposes you to ingredients and processes and, and all these things that you, you, may, you may not otherwise venture into, which I think is yep. cool. Okay. Well, thank you so much again for joining us for this episode. This may go up almost in, in totality whenever it does. Cause I think there's so much good information here. I hate to cut a whole mm-hmm. lot out. This is, this has been really cool. I, I, this is a different style of content than we usually do, but I, I like the hmm. like real deep dive aspect of it. So super cool. All right. Well, I hope to do another one of these again. Thank you so much <laughs> for your time. Awesome. Thank you. And happy brewing y'all.